Hello, everybody. Hey, Adam. Thanks for having me. Tony, as I mentioned, your story is fascinating. It's complex. In some cases, it's even hard to believe. For new listeners who, who've never come across any of your story before, can you give us a little bit of an introduction to your bio? Uh, and like, like I said, it's, it, it's hard to put it all in a nut. People that aren't familiar with what's the term 20 and back, uh, people are, um, they're able, they're, there are speak, space programs that are able to abduct people and use them for 20 years and then through some form of technology, age regress them back. So they age 20 years age regress them back to the same age they were taken and then put them back. And then here's where you lose people time travel them back to the, to 15 minutes after they were taken and put them back in bed that night. But they are able to use them for labor or whatever to be soldiers or whatever task they need for 20 years. So they're getting really, really, uh, I don't want to say free, but they're getting free labor out of it. Uh, and so these programs are doing this to people. Some people are chosen because of genetics and because they are uh, qualified to do certain tasks. Some people are just good at something. So they need that up there in these colonies. And uh, some people are being taken just as a brute force labor force out of prisons and things and uh, for slave labor. And in my case, I was taken for 20 years old, taken and um, woke up with no memory of my life, you know, no memory of mom and dad. And I lived 20 years. And then at the end of that, I, I was, I was moved from one project to another, to a few different uh, places. And I ended up on the series planetoid, a, a dwarf planet just past Mars where there is a German uh, based breakaway group from Nazi German, from the pre-war, I mean, from the World War II Germans that had gone into space and built a colony there. I ended up being six, maybe a few more years, six years basically on earth in that time, and then was moved to Mars on a project that was canceled, that didn't, that didn't work. So it was canceled. And then I, is kind of reintegrated into a new system. They give you an aptitude test and trained me for on a ship. And then I was shipped, I was moved to Ceres Colony and I lived the rest of my 20 years there. And at the end I was put back. I would, they have a base on the back of the moon where they do uh, a lot of the work. And I was put back there, age regressed, put back in my original body. However, that you know we can talk about that later. There's a lot of other info besides anything that I've said on that uh, technology. And uh, I woke up on a table with aliens there, not remembering the 20 years this time, but remembering my original life. And then they put me back, you know, that night. I woke up the next morning. I was a changed person. I wasn't the same. But I had no memories, really, of what happened to me. Uh, in uh, May, no, March of 2015, I had had repeated headaches. And I'd always had memories of the initial abduction of the gray and sitting in the base, I'd always had those memories. So I always knew that there were ETs and there were things going on that they don't tell us. But I didn't know, remember the rest of the things. In March of 15, I went to the doctor for repeated headaches. And she uh, had me do an MRI scan of my head. And I don't know if this is coincidental or not. But about two weeks after that is when the memories came back. And I had huge chunks of memories. And uh, I'd always had memories, flashes of times being out there. And I... I waking memories and I always dismiss those as my, I must have dreamt that last night or something because when could I have had that time? When could I, when could I have been on a spaceship? You know, I still have chronological memory of my life here, but once I accepted it and, and understood the time travel component of what they're doing um, and, and I accepted the fact that, Oh my God, I, I was out there for 20 years that that was real. And then the rest of the memories all came together and it flooded in. And it was over a period of six months, three to six months where I got giant chunks of memories. I contacted some people for help. I wanted counseling. I contacted some research, well, well-known researchers in the UFO field. And I, I wrote down a timeline and we went back and forth about things I remembered. And there were a lot of things. Some things didn't jive with other people's whistleblower um, testimonies, but a lot of people, I don't, I don't know of anybody that was, that says they were on series colony. So I would definitely witness things and a way of life that most people that have been in a space program didn't witness. So, but there are things that I've said that haven't matched up. And there are things that I said that have matched up to other whistleblowers. And the time on earth, I have found those places where I stayed. 
So to, I had to prove it to myself. I don't believe it. You say that some things I say might not be believable to our audience. I didn't believe it myself. I just had all these memories come to me and I was, you know, I wanted counseling. I didn't, I didn't want to accept it. Uh, the things I saw. Uh, but I found the place. I, I lived in a place near Seattle for a couple of years. I lived in Peru. We did missions down there for, uh, I was there for two, almost three years. And uh, I found those places. I, the memories came back first and I remembered those places. And then I went on Google Earth and I went, oh my God, there it is. There's the house. And I had memories. So I eventually traveled to the house in Seattle and I knew my way around. I knew the roads. I knew the route to get there. It's on, on one of the islands around Seattle. You have to take a ferry. I remember the ferry. I had spoke of the ferry to my parents when I was a kid after the 20 and back was over. And uh, they remember, we always joked about it, the same ferry ride. So how could a kid in the 70s or, you know, the early 80s uh, know about that ferry, the name of the ferry? So I did. That was one of the things like I had to prove it to myself. And it did. And, uh, you know, and the other thing is a lot of people say, well, what? I had somebody the other day say, was that a past life memory, you know, that you're remembering? And it wasn't because I was in Seattle and it's not a dream either because it, in a dream, when you're at a coffee shop in a dream, you don't know how you got to the coffee shop. You don't have a memory of riding in the car to the coffee shop or waking up that morning or leaving the coffee shop and going home and going to bed. These memories, I remember waking up in the morning. I remember going, standing in line, going through the shower. I remember the things I did to get to the spaceship that I worked on. And then the, the trip home. I remember I had friends, I had families, I had lovers. I had a life there. It was 20 years and I was an adult at the time. You know, I lived from nine years old till 29 years old in that, in that, uh, out there in a 20 and back. And so I had a fully developed life and then it was gone. And when I went back to being nine years old again, I wasn't the same. I was a little off because I had adult, uh, tendencies. I had things that were more adult. You know, my, even my, my dad said, what happened to you? I, you're not a kid anymore. I want my kid back. You know, he said that all the time and for years after that. So in a nutshell, I did a 20 and back. I was, um, as a slave, not because I was qualified, but because I had made somebody mad that had access to this technology. I had angered, I had bullied a kid in school whose father was high up in these programs and had access and he did it as a punishment to me. Uh, you know, and it worked, I gotta say it worked because I've been very humble and very, I've had a very low self-esteem ever since. Okay, and so you're not the first to come forward with information about the so-called 20 and back. Now, this might be new to some of our audience, but there's others who've testified about similar experiences and similar contracts with the SSP. Now, as you said, yours was involuntary. A lot of the other whistleblowers who are talking about their involvement in different aspects of the SSP, they moved up through the hierarchy of secrecy. They had a need to know, and they worked their way up the ladder through competence and aptitude and diligence and, and you know punctuality, showing up, doing your job, and keeping your lips sealed. And so you have a very different origins story. I'm wondering if we can go back. You started to briefly mention it there about how you know, you had a classmate who had been bullied, what, or you yourself had been bullied. Why don't we go back to that story and give our listeners the, you know, the runway so that we can kind of understand how you got into this mess? Sure. Um, well, I was in fourth grade. We're talking about 1981 to 1982 school year. Uh, I was nine years old, and um, there was a kid. I was chosen for the tag program, talented and gifted top 5% of the school. And there was a kid that came from outside the school district. He rode a limousine to school and his dad was in town. Uh, I think negotiating with, um, Coca-Cola, something with Coca-Cola. And he was the smartest kid in the class. And so for me to get chosen for the talented and gifted class, and I had, I was, a, you know, pretty close to a straight A student. I was a very good student. And in my family at home that gave me, I was the youngest kid. So it gave me something to be proud of. So being smart was, you know, I was, a, nine, I was nine. So, I mean, in the terms of a kid at that age, I was proud of being smart. So then I got into this class and this kid was just way, way smarter than anybody else I'd ever met before that. I mean, he was just a very brilliant person and um, very kind of arrogant. 
And uh, so it bothered me and I wanted to shoot him down. You know, I, I, I wanted to be the smartest kid in school. So we kind of didn't get along. There was a really, it was tense. I did some root stuff to him. I came in one day to the library and it was him and a few, four or five girls sitting around. We were early for our class for that gifted class it was like on Wednesdays. And uh, they said, he can read your mind, do it to him. And he didn't want to. And I didn't believe it that anybody could read your mind. And I guess he was, the girls were doing things like picking a color and he would tell them what color they were thinking about. They were all laughing about it. So, so I said, go ahead, do it. Read my mind. And I looked at him and I didn't believe that it was real because if I did, I would have, would have never been so cruel. But I looked at him and I thought to myself, you're the ugliest kid I've ever seen. And none of these girls will ever be with you. And you're going to be lonely your whole life because you're so ugly. And, you know, and this was on the, on the, this is on the mentality of kids, fourth graders, you know, the mean kid. And, and so I shouldn't have done that for one thing, but I was a kid. And number two, I didn't think that anybody could read anybody's mind. And I could tell by the look on his face, as soon as I thought that intensely, that he knew what I said and he was hurt from it. He just remained silent and we quit doing it. But ever after that, he intensely hated me. And later on that school year for the science fair, his dad came in and was the judge. He said, my dad's an Illuminati. What's your dad do one day? And I had no idea what that was. I said, my dad works for General Motors. He's got a great job. But I didn't know what that was, but it stuck out, stuck out in my head. You know, uh, but later on that year, his dad came in to be a, uh, a judge for the science fair. And when we were in the cafeteria setting up, was was in the cafeteria, I walked by them and he pointed, said, that's the kid I told you about, dad that ruined my confidence that he's like, that's the one I told you about. And his dad, they said some weird stuff. They said they could have, could have said breakaway, the word breakaway, but they said some weird stuff. Like we'll, we'll put him through a program. And I remember him saying, well, he doesn't deserve that. And they said some other stuff and I just didn't pay any attention beyond that. And went on about my day. And it was only a day or two later. It was, could have been later that night or the next day that I woke up with a gray alien in my face. We had uh the old style telephone in the house, there were lights, lights outside the windows lighting up and disappearing. Phone ringing for, you know, nobody would get up and get it, which was strange because people always got the phone in my house back then. We had the old phone with the long cord, the ringer, and uh, nobody got up. The dogs didn't bark, nothing. The phone would ring and then the lights came on again. And then I could have swore there was a bright blue orb that crackled and flew through the house, came in and it like tickled. You know, I, I remember I like giggled at it and then went back to sleep. I found them uh, in the other room with my mom and dad. I heard my mom talking to somebody. And then I remember seeing a gray in my face, a gray, I mean, close. And I thought it was my dad joking. My dad always had a good sense of humor and always pulled jokes. My dad always had practical jokes going on. And I said, dad, take off the mesh it. And it was cold. I touched his face like right here and it was cold and very porous. It was wet and cold and, and cold though. There was no heat and it was very porous. You could feel the pores, the big porous. And I went, ah, you know, from shock. And then it just, I froze. It, they, I was paralyzed. And at the end of my bed, I saw a few more, I think four more, three or four more shorter reptoid reptilian, like maybe four feet tall walk in around and they grabbed me and carried me. And there was a bright flash at the end of my bed and I kind of lost consciousness at that point. And I woke up, it was your standard abduction experience that everybody says they go through. And I'd always remember that. I, these are things that never, those are memories that really never got erased. They never got um, erased. I always remember just that part being taken clearly. But after, what happened after that, I didn't remember. And they, what ha they had done um, tests on me. And they asked my permission. He said, in his exact words, he said, we want to borrow your consciousness and you're going to live for 20 years and we're going to put you back. And I said, no, I can't do that. You know, I have my parents. I can't be without my parents for 20 years. And he said, no, we're going to put you right back in time. You're going to, it'll be like you never left. I'm like this was, I was so lucky that this was going to happen. And um, from there, they put me, laid me back on a the table. There, there, there was a few things and then, they put a sheet over me. The table sucked it tight to the tight to me and they cut a hole for me to breathe and they cut around my right eye and cut that out. And a big needle went in and went bang. And if I lost consciousness again, but it felt like I was being sucked out of my body at that point. 
And the next thing I remember is waking up with a human doctor and a human nurse uh, in a desert. Uh, it was Inyo Kern Air Base. You know, I, I found that too. I found those buildings. I want to go back there and visit it. But um, it was a human doctor. And I went from, and I had no memory of my mom or dad or my sister or where I'm from. I woke up with amnesia. At that point, I had no idea what I was. He put me through a standard medical exam. And we went through a trauma-based mind control program at that time. And I, it might've been six weeks. It might've been six months, honestly, after they got to the sleep deprivation part of it, I, I have no idea what happened. Um, but it was torture. They would torture you and watch We'd watch movies even with drugs and they'd watch movies with subliminal messages and then uh, electrical shock torture. They dislocated an arm. Um, he was very matter of fact about it. They did, uh, you know, we passed at the end and uh, they did psychic training and they were putting us, they were, they were bringing us close to, uh, I don't know, close to death, heck, denying us air. And then sometimes they did it with drugs. And I guess during that time, uh, because of the mind fraction with the, with the type of torture they did during that time that they were, be, they were able to communicate with, uh, I don't know, spirits, I don't, some other beings, I don't know, but other, they were able to get information from us, uh, like on a psychic level. So they could get future uh, events or past events that nobody knew about. And it was a class of kids. There were maybe a dozen kids. I want to say a dozen, probably less, less than that. Eight, eight to 12 kids in the class. And it was all the same thing. We all ended up uh, going through that. Okay, let me stop you right there. So I have a question regarding the initial abduction with the gray and reptilians in your room. Now you said that your family didn't stir in the night, even though there were lights, even though there were sounds. Do you, you know, and we've heard this in other abduction stories, do you think that they were paralyzed? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, so to jump forward 20 years later, I was put back and I woke up the next morning. I was put back that night. People that have suggested that people that are taken in 20 backs are only gone about 15 minutes. That they can get in, take you. You can do 20 years or 40. There are 40 in backs. It depends on genetics. Um, but it's a different, different thing. From people I've spoken to, they do a 20 and then another 20. So anyhow, people can go be taken, do 20 years, and they can put you back looking the same age as you looked when they took you 15 minutes later and then with your memory erased so that you don't know what happened, but they had labor. They had you for whatever, for, you know, if you're, if you have an aptitude at something that they need, then they could train you. You got to think I woke up with amnesia and I was trained. Well, you know, in the form of a slave at that point to do psychic service because of my age that only lasted till I was uh, in puberty. And then I, went to the next uh, you when you think of terms of a corporation or or a, a large body using lab, labor slave labor then that's a very uh, effective technique it's a very why wouldn't they do that because um, you're you don't remember it and i remember this that was the thing they always beat me over the head with the whole time you can't do this you can't treat me like this anytime i complained about anything during that 20 years they said uh you're not going to remember anyway so you know well, and even from maybe a karmic point of view, you said that they had received your permission to borrow your consciousness. So do you think that that's something that's a critical karmic component to this, where they have to actually obtain your permission first? To, and then, so I had to agree to it, but the, even they didn't exactly give me the rundown on what I was going to go through. They just said, can we do this? Yes or no. Honestly, at the time that, you know, when I woke up on the table with aliens there, I thought I was in a first contact situation. I thought, yeah, I knew you guys were real. I can't wait. I'm going to tell everybody when I get home. I wanted to cooperate. I was happy. I was ecstatic to finally learn that there was ET extraterrestrial life. There were other intelligent beings. And as a little kid that was into sci-fi, I was really into that. Um, but when I went back the following morning, we went down and sat and had breakfast. And it was awkward because we usually skipped breakfast and just went on. That next morning, uh, my parents were silent. My dad was upset. I think they took him too. 
And uh, my sister said, boy, there was a lot of bright lights last night. You guys see those bright lights? And the only thing anybody ever said was, be quiet. And I said, I feel like I haven't seen you guys in years. I can't believe it. I feel like I haven't been here in years. And that was the feeling. I really had the legitimate feeling of returning to my life. I couldn't believe it. I was back in my life. How many movies did portray that scene? You know, like back to the legitimately, I was shocked that I was back into my life. I felt older. I didn't remember it. I didn't know why. But, and I was a different person. I was different. I wasn't the same kid from the day before. My behavior changed. Everything, everything changed. Now, in a lot of your follow-up research in recent years, since the memories have started to return to you, you've started to identify specific locations and you've begun to connect some of those dots. Have you thought about doing research into the family that you believe was behind this, the, the boy and his father? Do you remember their last name and did you look into them? Yeah, I found them. Um, well, at least on, at least their, at least their social media presence. They're out there. These people are alive. The places I, I lived for two years with a satanic, with a practicing Satanist billionaire. I found his obituary since died. I think it was, I think it was 06 that he passed away. Him and his wife that both took care of me in Seattle, they both passed on, but they have surviving family. And for obvious reasons, I don't share their names. Uh, I'm not trying to get revenge. And more than more importantly, I'm not trying to poke a hornet's nest. Right. I'm trying, people asked me when, you know, people have asked me for my uh, account, things that I remember. And so I said so, but I, uh, I still feel that I would be in great, uh, a great deal of danger if I were to contact the guy, the doctor at, uh, in, in your current base that put me through the trauma-based mind control, I found him. He's a public figure. And so I'm not, I don't want to mention his name either because, and I thought about contacting him and saying, Hey, I was one of those kids at Inukern. I remember you. Now, I would love to talk to him, but honestly, I, again, I think I'd be poking a hornet's nest and I, you know, I have a family, I have a normal life going on and I would like, to, I'm happy where I'm at right now. I'd like to stay there. So my basis of telling my account is just for history's sake for people to know number one, that it's, that's what goes on up there, out there, you know, and um, number two, in the, in the future, they're going to have to, they're going to have to tell us this stuff sooner or later. In the future, they're going to have to tell us. Somebody's going to figure it out, aren't, you know, and so my account will just add up with other guys that have whistleblown and it'll be, it'll be more info for people in the future to look back on and say, you know, you guys did this. What he said is true. You know, um, series has a geyser, the series colony. I'll send you a picture of where the hangar bay was, where we flew into the base. There was a series of bases underneath the surface of the planet. There was something like a quarter million people living there, 225,000 people living there permanently that are not in 20 MX. They're just citizens. Citizen. There were two other ET races living alongside the Germans there, taller races. There's artificial gravity inside there for miles. Uh, millions of square feet of artificial floor plating Look across it. They get less gravity. Uh, it was my experience that ETs that were smaller came from heavier gravity planets. The shorter reptile ones were from a bigger planet. They had heavier gravity, so they were very strong and very robustly built. The taller, frailer looking ETs come from smaller planets that have less gravity than ours. And so during that, they had some sort of like a bracelet or something. They had something that lowered the gravity for them where they walked. And we had normal gravity, even though Ceres is only a small planetoid, only like 580 miles diameter. It's very small. And you could get work of trains inside the, uh, that you went from little, little underground towns to one to another. Um, but I'll get you some pictures of that. Maybe you can put those up. So, Tony, a lot of people are going to wonder, I guess, as the next logical question, if you spent, I think, the first eight years of your 20 and back here on Earth and then the next 12 on Ceres, the asteroid, the planetoid, what were you doing there? What, what made up the majority of that 12-year stint? Sorry, you're breaking up, Adam. You're breaking up on me. Yeah, so a lot of people are going to wonder of the 12 years that you spent on Cirrus, the asteroid, the planetoid, what were you doing for the majority of that time? What was your role and your responsibility there? What was the mission? The very first thing I did um, 
the very first day when I got there, uh, there was like an orientation, a medical exam, and they kept us, we were slaves, and they kept thousands of slaves living in um, like a prison, but without doors, without the bar door in a prison, but like a cell. I had a little cot, I had a little um, a drawer, like a dresser that was attached to the wall, and no door, three walls. And it was probably a five by eight or so um, big space. And then there were rows of guys like that. It was like a prison. And at the end was a main door with security you had to go through. So I could come and go as I wanted, but I had to, as long as I made it to work when I was supposed to the next morning at the hangar. And um, the first day I got mistaken, it was assigned to a mine, the mines. They were mining there looking for water and, and opening up space to build uh, uh Space was at a premium. They didn't have enough space. It was always, they always wanted to keep mining and get the water out so that they could build more towns in there. Uh, there was, it was heavy construction going on when I was there the whole time. Mines, it was a mistake. I, there was security waiting for me when I got back from the mines that first day. And I had been trained to do ship repair. And I thought, knew something was wrong. So the next day, I didn't make the mistake. Uh, somebody else did and got in trouble. The next day, I took a train, a separate train to the hangar bay, and I didn't see the ship. I never saw the ship. I kind of got off a train and walked right to an umbilical, like when you walk out onto an airplane, you know, that long hallway that moves. It was an umbilical. And I walked through there, and it was the bottom, um, the bottom floors of a, of a spaceship. And it was an older, like a converted submarine. It looked like a submarine, like a like what you would imagine a submarine looks like. We had the doors that you had to step over that would, that would turn shut. There were big pipes. And um, there was like a, uh, uh, there was a tool crib and there was a McDonald's looking screen, like a flat screen, like an industrial screen. And we, it was myself and two other guys like me. We had collars that would shock collars that told where we were and what we we're doing. And they could shock us with it and punish us. And uh, every morning we went there, I, I rode the train, we showered and did our thing. I had uh, like a jumpsuit that I wore and we, we would go there and I'd report to that monitor, the door would close, we'd be on a ship and the monitor would say, you know, our number and what to do. You're going to go to the tool crib and grab this, this and this that was numbered and come back here. And it had a list of detail. It wasn't complicated. I mean, it wasn't hard to do. It was. It wasn't skillful. It was a list of what to do exactly. Step one: go there and clear the area. Step two: cut this out. Set this um, up on it and cut it. Step three: clear the area. Step four: you know, go back and and get the parts. Your the parts you need will be waiting for you in the tool crib over in the section. You know, the things we needed that day will be waiting for us. And we did maintenance. We did ship maintenance. We did repair. And uh, that went on for years and that and then at the end of the day uh, you know after an eight hour day or 10 hours depending the ship would land the door would open you're done put everything back the door would open i'd go and get back on my train and go back to my room and sometimes when you got there off the train to your room they had uh cleaning duty you know they had stuff for us to do but most of the time they didn't mess with me they got the slave guys got that the other the miners got that and um i would just go back to my room that was it that was my whole that was my existence it was miserable uh, during those years and I remember I remember I wanted to die. I remember that uh, Prior to that there had been times when my life was in threatened, you know, and uh, I, I I Wanted to live I, I did whatever it could I could to live. I remember I, I always had a uh, Always wanted to live. I was even though I was being been through what I what I went through and I remember in those years, it was such a min mundane groundhog. The other two guys didn't like me. And uh, so I didn't have any friends or anything. And I remember in those years, I just was miserable. It was so depressing, you know. I just wanted to die. Uh, eventually, that ship broke down, and they upgraded it. And I got promoted into cargo. And I was a cargo engineer on the, on the next ship, which was a bigger, more modern ship, more more like the enterprise kind of interior that you would imagine. Not, a, not so much a submarine. The lower decks in the cargo area was more metal, uh, uh, metal kind of uh, arch, uh, archetype. But, but the upper decks had upper decks and there were in the front of the, there was an elevator and there was a lot more crew on that ship. 
And then there I did cargo. Basically, whenever we, we did cargo missions, we went all over the place. There was a portal. We went extra galactic. Some said that um, something like uh, only 2% of our missions we ever did were within the visible range of stars from the Earth or from Ceres. You know, the stars that you can see at night with your eyes were too Too close basically that on all our missions and we went we'd like we'd leave we'd come home at, at night um, and the ship also here's the other thing that um, the ship came back many times only a few minutes after it left so when they portaled they would the ship would take off leave leave the base and then portal out to another system and it would portal back to only a few minutes prior than it left and they could scrub the mission they there was a loophole i guess there are um there are higher beings in the universe that police time travel in other words if you take advantage of time travel some other advanced being will come and punish you you'll get policed so there are they stretched it there's there are rules to time travel and what they did was they they'd go far from series five minutes out and go then they would come back five minutes before they left you know maybe on the other side and that way, if the mission was a failure, they would park somewhere somewhere different and they would not send the ship and they would scrub the mission and we would just do maintenance that day. And this happened a lot. They were, there were a lot of scrub. They called it anti-telephoning. Um, and then when the other ship took off, the original one left, then we would fly back five minutes and we'd get there according to the law right as soon as we left. That was as much as you could stretch it. So they figured out to go into distance. There was a, it was a, it was a cheat on inner on whatever interdimensional law and time traveling law. Um, that's something that's policed by higher uh, ETs, more advanced beings. And they were very afraid. They said that people that got in trouble for that, that the punishments were un, unbelievably bad, that um, it wasn't like they find you or something. They, it was, the punishment was very bad. And they were they were very afraid of it, so they had it worked out to a science, and it was a big secret. So I'm, I'm totally spilling the beans on it. It was a secret for, between them and the other colonies at the time. Okay, wow. All right. So time travel, age regression, portal technology, extraterrestrials. I promised this would be fascinating, and I think it certainly is panning out to be quite phenomenal. Tony, that's all the time we have for today. We hope you join us in the next episode where we're gonna get more into the topic of the time he spent aboard the Dark Fleet craft. For Dauntless Dialogue, I'm Adam Riva. We'll see you in the next episode. It's right here on Earth. Welcome back to episode two of Breakaway, a new series that we're doing here on Dauntless Dialogue. We're going to be releasing one episode a week where we are interviewing whistleblowers from the ostensible secret space program. With me today is Tony Rodriguez, a survivor of the 20 and back, and he has quite the fascinating story that he's sharing with us one piece at a time. Now today we're going to be diving more into his experience on board the Dark Fleet craft and some of the other experiences that he had while he was in the solar system and outside the solar system. So Tony, why don't you start us off today by giving us a brief description of some of the craft that you were on? Well, like I said, the first one, um, uh, I had made a few trips from Earth to the moon and that was on your standard TR-3B one and then there were smaller crafts. I was stationed on Mars for a time and there were smaller craft there 
um, the ones I ended up working on on series, the first one was I never really saw it on the from the outside of it, and I only was allowed in the bottom part of it, which was a small area. Um, you know, I'd like to think the size of maybe five thousand square feet total that I saw of the craft on on our deck. I never really left it other than to leave it. And I never saw it from the outside. When I got it out off the umbilical, it was, there was a door, so you couldn't see the craft, and there was a train. There was a train station. Like, so I just immediately got on my train and left. So that first one was like, just like a submarine on the inside, uh, more roomy. Uh, there, was, there was more room to it. There were some small areas, but there were, there were big rooms in, in it uh, that were not like a submarine, not super, super cramped. <clears throat> Uh, there was a lot of tubing, a lot of piping that went through it that moved radioactive water and other chemicals uh, that went through. And that was the highly corrosive chemicals went through it. And so we ended up having to replace valves that went bad quite often uh, that they would, they would uh, corrode on the inside because of whatever chemical they used. But that was just the area that we were. And then there were hydraulics that happened. There were, there were hydraulic processes that happened above us that the hydraulics were located where we were at. And we basically would always maintain the level of fluids. Sometimes we would go and replace hoses and things to those. But, um, but we maintained hydraulic fluids too. For, and I have no idea what they were, doors opening or whatever it was, lifts or things. But um, that was pretty much my job there. And, so, and there were the submarine doors that you had to step. We were always, you would always be in a hurry. We'd always have to run and get something real quick and come back and you would trip on that thing. You'd think after years and years that you wouldn't, but it's true. You, um, you mind is elsewhere, and we'd always. I tripped on that thing hundreds and hundreds of times uh, over stepping over the threshold door. So the next ship I was on, I was very happy that it still had a threshold, still had doors that pocket like a pocket door that could close, not not an open swimming door, but it still had a threshold. But it was only a couple inches tall. It was very easy to get over, and I never really tripped on it. And that was a much bigger ship, and um, I w I w it had five cargo bays, two, two on each side that could collapse into one giant cargo bay, which we never did. But they had walls that were could pressurize, so you could open up to vacuum with space, and the, the walls could open, so they could rearrange the cargo bay. And then there was another, not exactly a cargo, but a cargo cargo storage underneath the main cargo bay that was probably only six feet tall worth of packages. We had packages of things that we offered for trade down there in that storage. And the guys always hated going down there and have say, oh, we got to roll out package A, you know, for instance, they were numbered, but we have to roll out package A. And so the guys had to go down there and get the stuff and bring it up to the cargo bay. And then we'd open the door and unload it, offload it. We could offload things into space. We offloaded cargo into the vacuum of space. There was a, it was a vortex loader. And uh, what it did was the cargo, it would shine a laser on the cargo so that people knew to stand back. It was a safety light, like a light. It was a laser, a, a bright white light. And above it, there would be, it would make a vortex and it would lift it up. And in zero gravity, it would make two vortexes and move them around like that. And it would pick up, cargo and move it out or move it in so um the loader was fun to use we fought over it whenever there was whenever we needed somebody to jump on the, uh, the vortex loader we call it the auto loader um whenever somebody needed to get on that we'd race to it because we got there first got to do it and uh, you didn't really need a lot of training to use it. it was like a video game it was a really easy job but that's what i did and when we got out we when we got cargo on my job was to measure it and uh, weigh it and then i put it i i would take a long i had a clipboard a little clipboard and i'd make notes at a little thing you know i'd make notes and then i'd go back to my station which was a touch screen on a on like a pillar on a you know it was a touch i'll send you a picture i've drawn of it and i could log in my D number and then i could work at any of the stations uh, you know we were like right above the in between the cargo bay and the next deck up there was a little space that we worked in and I would sit there for hours and just log in all the weights and dimensions. Anything really tall went into the main cargo bay in the back that, in, that was much bigger. And then that one could lower the floor. They could lower the floor and, and create space. It had an entire hydraulic floor 
that could go down three or four feet. And the bar that, that they could. So those guys got all the tall. They dealt with anything that was tall, I think over a meter and a half tall or meter, meter and a quarter, something like that. Anything that was tall had a tipping, had another uh, dimension to it of a tipping report. They had the way the, I don't know, figure out the top of it. There was a tipping report and I didn't have to deal with that. The guys in the main cargo bay did. So I had that cargo bay and I had a few guys under me that would go and I would tell them how to arrange things. And the computer would spit out, after I put in all the dimensions of everything, the computer would spit out on how to stack it. And I would just go and oversee that with the guys. That was basically my job for, I don't know, two and a half, three years. Okay. The end. And I would do briefings with the command in the mornings because they, I would, they kept all the cargo bay guys, all the cargo engineers that were in charge of the cargo bay guys were there in the morning briefing and they would speak in German and they had a translator. They could flip it on and off and we could understand them when they wanted to talk to us, they'd turn it on and you could hear it. It was a, there was a translator translating tech. I don't know if it was an implant in my head or if it was local. It worked in the elevator. I remember standing outside the elevator of the ship with two guys talking in German. And as soon as we passed through the door, I could understand what they were saying was English to me. And they realized it and shut up. And then when we started going, they talk, we talked to me. It's a little bit small talk. And when the, elevator, the door opened, they walked back out. And when they walked out the door, it was right back to German again. I couldn't understand them. So that was it. And uh, so that was there. And it was at the train station. But like when you, right when you got off the ship, there was an area there that the translator worked because there was a guy from Italy. There was a guy that spoke Italian that worked in the main, in the main cargo bay that was funny. And so we'd rub into him all day. Couldn't understand what he said. So we'd catch him at the exit at the end of the day and say, what were you talking about, man? And he was funny. He was kind of like, uh, uh, he kind of had like a really mean, like a mean sense. He'd be mean to you, but he it. so it was a sense of humor was, was like uh, aggressive, you know, but, um, that was basically where I spent my days. Uh, so I, I did, in the morning, I didn't go into the rear umbilical of the ship. I went into the forward umbilical of the ship with the crew, with the, with the actual crew that were not slaves. And that's very important. That was the first time I ever really rubbed elbows with them. And uh, I wore a different color suit. I wore a, a A dark gray or light gray and I wore a dark gray or it was vice versa I wore a light gray and they wore a dark gray I think that's what it was I was light gray and then the uh there was guys in the crew that wore black and there were people that wore navy blue a dark navy blue and then the command some of them wore like a like a, a blue with a gray tint on it I would go there in the morning and take the elevator up and go to the command briefing sit down I had coffee they'd have muffins and stuff there bagels that was my break counted as breakfast. They regulated everything we did. Um, I was only allowed to go to the bathroom for a short time. I had a lunch. And if you didn't eat lunch, you got in trouble. You had to eat your three meals a day, no matter what, or they'd send you to the doctor and the doctor would be unpleasant. And, um, but I'd get up in the morning, I'd go there and there was a long, it was a table with a long white room and it looked like the panel on an airplane, like with the uh, grid of fabric glued to a plastic paneling. That's what the walls were in the front, in the command area. And um, there was a long white table, and they all had their own little tablet pads that they used. And so they would go between each other and see, all, and I, most of the time I sat there with my little clipboard, and they would call on me and usually ask how much room is left in the cargo bay that was available. And that was my report, and that was it. And then we talked, you know, they would talk, and um, it was just like hanging out with guys. I mean, I mean, they were German guys that not, they were not born on earth. They were born on series. So, um, but they were people just like you and me, um, just a different culture. Now, Tony, did you have a job title and, and were you ever given promotions during your time? Well, there? The, going to the cargo engineer was the promotion from the original title. And there, there was a rank, there was a number. It was, I don't want to say E, but it, there was a number like a, or a letter and a number like an E2, like a D2 or something which was levels below the lowest rank in, that they had. And they had naval rank. Like at the, the top, there was a cor I remember. I always remember, it's like my head, they had a Corvette captain and then a cap captain or Capitan captain. There was a captain, there was another one, and there, there was a Corvette captain. And I always remembered that word. And I looked up later, the German Navy does still did use 
ranks like that. But it went all the way down, and there was a rank, and then there I was just like one rank. I was two ranks below it, and I got promoted to the rank below actually being a serviceman, which I could never could because I was a, technically I was a slave. Hmm. Um, now, I got demoted from, from that eventually. The other thing about the ship is bef when – when the old ship broke down and was decommissioned, there were a period of months in between when the other ship wasn't finished being built yet. Or it was built, but it was being converted to do the job it was going to do. Like, you know, like whatever they bought it from whoever built it or brought it. I don't know. How, I don't know the politics involved, but basically the ship came to series, sat in the hangar bay, and then they modified it for it to, do, to, to set it up how they wanted it. And that was a few months. During that time, they came and got me. It was pretty cush, but uh, I went to classes. They put me through like a phys ed thing, and I went to new classes to learn my job. And um, they came and got me one day, and I didn't have to go. I was, you know, it was dreadful because it was like long hours, and it was, you know, it was boring. But they came and got me one day and took me to the hangar area. And at the top of it, there was, imagine like a window, imagine a giant hangar uh, room. 500 feet tall, at least 600 feet tall, very big, by thousands of feet long and wide. It was just a massive wind. It looked like when you're looking out the airplane onto a tarmac, or from, from an airport out onto the tarmac, how there's a row of seats when you're waiting at your gate. It was a window like that that looked down, and I could see the front of the ship from above it. And I thought it was just gorgeous. It was beautiful. It was. It had the lines like a stealth like a, like a B2 bomber, you know, it had the, the stealth kind of lines and it was a blue, it was a black with like a blue, like a, like a black with a blue tint color. And, um, there were a scaffolding on the, on the, like on the ship, on the front of it, there was scaffolding. It was under construction. They were building something like a big protruding, like a tower in the middle of the ship that I never saw it finished. But then I took a, a guy came and got me. Uh, I was supposed to go there and meet somebody. And I did, I reported and met someone. And I had to stay there for a minute, uh, 30 minutes. And then a guy came and got me. And he was in a different uniform. He's greasy. So he was one of the flight crew people that worked down below. And we rode an elevator, like a lift. But it was an industrial, like an elevator where you're exterior. And you could see I rode it down in that big room to the bottom. And then he had a six-wheeled, like a golf cart, like an electrical golf cart. Like it was six wheels truck. And we, we rode under the ship and through the back of it and it was rounded in the back or it was it came to a taper and it was flat across the back where the where the car the main cargo bay doors were and then I, he pointed out my he said you're going to work there i said why am i doing this they didn't even tell me why he said you have to be familiar with your cargo doors so in case something happens you need to know what it looks like on the outside so this is going to familiar you just get one trip we rode down under the ship i saw I saw my cargo doors and so there were some windows and things, you know, when you're up close to it. And then he rode me back and I, uh, another guy came and I didn't ride the elevator back up. There was another guy came and got me and walked me back to a train and I went back to class and I, it was just beautiful. The, um, I was like stoked that I saw that, that you know, it was, I didn't, I didn't get out much, so it didn't take a whole lot to impress me back then, but it was a pretty big ship. And I've done the math on, uh, we used to pick up cargo at Diego Garcia, and so I've used Google Earth and done the math, and I, I estimate the ship was about 1,000 feet long by about uh, 600 feet wide, and it had to be a different dimension tall, maybe four, four or 500 feet tall. Um, but that's what it been, about 1,000 feet long or um, 600 meters or something like that. So it wasn't the biggest ship out there, but it was a fast cargo cargo ship. You still there, Adam? It looks like you're lagging. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. And um, you're reminding me of some real world examples, um, some evidence that we can look at. When Gary McKinnon pulled off what was called the biggest computer hack or the biggest uh, military hack of all time, he broke into some NASA servers and some Navy Space Command servers. And he found evidence of a couple of things. He found some flight manifests from some of these ships, which contained, um, there was different categories, different headers for different columns. Some of them said terrestrial officers and others said non-terrestrial officers. And others, there were, you know, some of the 
um, manifests for cargo loads and it said fleet to fleet transfers. And so, you know, I guess I'm going to throw that back at you and I want to kind of drive home a little bit on what types of cargo do you think you were moving since this was such a big part of your job? Did you ever, were you allowed to ask questions and did you ever snoop into that? Well, officially, no. Uh, the, my official responsibility was to not care about the cargo. I, you know, I got a box. It was, my, it was my job to make sure the box did not get damaged, make sure it got stacked efficiently, and it made sure it got to where it was going. And it was none of my business what was in it. It did, however, open up cargo. There was cargo that was broken. I saw inside of it. There were, we took everything you can imagine. We took water. We took people. We took um, crates. We took cardboard. We took giant graphite things, that, uh, boxes that were made out of like a graphite that could go, that, were pre that could handle vacuum. We took weapons. We took missiles. We took 55-gallon um, drums of chemicals. We took... Uh, um, Things from our T-shirts. We took ten. We took well, one time. We had like ten thousand pairs of military boots that we took back to series. We picked it up at Diego Garcia. It was just surplus, so they took it. It was free, free for them. So they took. They were military boots. And the only reason I know that is because when I walked in in the morning, one of the girls from uh, the front of the ship, I think navigation or something, was showing them off. She said, Look at my boots we got. You know, these are what came in. So that's how I knew. That's the only way I knew what was in the cargo. I just remember giant crate, big crates that came in. But um, we took things. I got in trouble. Um, it's a long story, but I got in trouble for reporting. One opened up, and I looked inside, and there was coffee. And it was on the manifest of things that were banned. I guess coffee to other ETs is a um, narcotic, like a very strong drug to certain ET races. So it, it was being sold as for that reason, not because of what we would think coffee. And so I reported it and because I did my job, but really they were sneaking it in there and they knew about it. So it was, I wasn't supposed to know. So it caused a big trouble. So I didn't get in trouble. I didn't get in trouble for it. I did my job correctly, but they got in trouble. And so it was, It caused a big deal in the end all, and then they took it the next day. But um, because I found them, the guys made me drink coffee every morning. You're drinking coffee here, you know, and it was like a running joke with me. So, Tony, I want to ask you a question regarding uh, this Diego Garcia base. How, in your opinion, how is it that you were able to bring in a, a craft down into you at, you know, um, into Earth's airspace, or did you have a scout craft that was smaller, or was it cloaked? Well, it was. It had stealth, uh, the kind of technology, like the they they keep that from you purposely, I guess, so that um, I guess other ETs can't psychically scan the crew in the back and learn about the craft so they compartmentalize the tech uh, so i wasn't sure about a lot of the things on the craft um diego garcia had um, was an american place and it was ran by american personnel but only a handful of them knew about us the rest of the personnel had no idea what was going on we would come at three or four in the morning two in the morning there and come vertically down into a certain parking lot you know like a big parking lot area and everybody was uh, gone, you know, like it's very, the, they ran a tight ship there. People had to go home. There was a curfew on Diego Garcia for people. They had to be in there. They had to be in at night. And um, so there was only a handful of Americans. There were guys, we did missions where they had to come with us and they knew that they were going to be blanked. They knew they were going to have their memories erased when they got back. And um, they were, uh, there were a lot of things that we weren't, they weren't aware of us doing. But there was always a, we had to sign a manifest when we picked up cargo there. And they gave us bootleg stuff that we weren't supposed to have. I think other whistleblowers, uh, researchers have a problem with me saying that we listen to music from the earth because that's a big no-no up there. And, uh, but there were bootleg things, uh, entertainment that found its way to series colony for the colonists to listen to. Uh, earth music and uh, books and stories and things, even movies got bootlegged through Diego Garcia up there, which is a huge, which is a huge illegal illegality. 
in the secret space programs. They, they keep the, and, and um, they don't want to listen to it. There's mind control components to the music we listen to. So they didn't want to be exposed to that, but they did. People snuck that stuff through there. Uh, there was a demand for it. And so, uh, trying to think some other Tony, I have a question regarding Diego Garcia. So some of our listeners might remember the missing flight, um, out of Malaysia 370, which there were a lot of conspiracy theories about where it went and some images surfaced in the months succeeding this event. Um, someone had supposedly, um, you know, snuck a, an iPhone, um, in their rear end and were able to manage to snap a picture of Diego Garcia base. And there was, um, you know, geo locating metadata embedded deep within the picture, which you just can't fake. So I'm wondering if there's any overlap with a conspiracy theory like that. It seems like there's a lot of shady things that are connected to Diego Garcia. Well, it was for, okay. From from what I know, this was I was there way before the Malaysia flight would have happened. Um, it was a spaceport. It was a spaceport for goods for the Germans that came through. We had we there were times when we had to wait for shipments. We got there and the shipment was late, and so we would go out to sea. They let us go swimming. There were times we went to the Turtle Bay or Turtle Cove. It's Turtle Bay, I think, in the nook at the bottom part of Diego Garcia, we went swimming and they would let the crew swim. We, we had to wait a couple hours and uh, they were confident that people that weren't classified, weren't, uh, didn't have security clearance to see us there, wouldn't see us. So they had that under control there. Um, but absolutely it was a port. We were getting goods. So that was our joke. We always joked about it. What are we picking up? We're picking up goods from, uh, we're picking up Russian, Russian military goods off a Chinese boat from single, a base with an Italian first name and a Spanish second name in the Indian Ocean that's an American base going to the Germans in space. Like, it was a running joke. We kept adding on to that. We kept adding on, you know what I mean, as many nationalities to that sentence as we could. We're picking up Chinese cargo from a, from a Singapore boat, you know, at a base with an Italian first name and a Spanish second name in the Indian Ocean ran by Americans. <laughs> going to Germans, you know, and so that's how I remembered it. I remember, I always remembered that was like our, that was like a running joke for us. But, um, I remember one time we, we, the, one of the officers from America, the Americans said, look, you guys are running up a big tab. You guys need, you're in the millions here of money that you owe. And so the next morning at the, at the briefing, the security briefing, or the mission briefing on the ship, the next back on series, the next morning I brought it up, raised my hand says, anybody have anything to add? And I raised my hand and said, the guy at Diego Garcia says we need to pay our tab that we're running it up. And they burst into laughter. <laughs> because they weren't paying anything. It was an illusion to the, to the guys giving us the cargo. They think that there's a trade going on, that there's a financial arrangement. There's not. They got everything they took from us. They, whenever they needed any kind of military hardware or anything for that matter, it got shipped to Diego Garcia, unloaded, waited there in that hangar, and we got, we came in in the middle of the night and scooped it up, and there was no charge. So it's that's that's the kind of level, uh, you know, it's being paid for by the trillions of dollars that's missing of the black op, black ops or whatever you know the Pentagon missed. That's how the accounting is working. The Germans weren't paying anything. They looked at the, whenever whenever I was on Ceres Colony, it was a symbol that represented the Earth Earth Colony. It had a chain around it. It was the earth, it was a picture of the earth with a chain around it to symbolize that it was enslaved. So that's how they that's how they regarded us. They were not concerned with Earth's well being at all. They concerned they regarded it as something they owned. Okay, so Tony, help me connect some dots here. I guess I'm wondering how you got shuffled into a German secret space program when you were, you know, living in America. Can you square that circle for us? Yeah, well, I mean, it's easier if we go through chronological order, but basically I ended up in Seattle living in a house, private residence of a billionaire, and he was a practicing Satanist and obviously connected with the program. Um, after I had already been in Peru for a few years, and um, 
they were using that technology from the MK Ultra stuff. They were giving us me injections and putting me on shipments of cocaine from Porto to Wantansuyo, Peru, to Santa Marta, Colombia. They would ship up. It was a C-46, command, it was 46, 42, C-46 commando cargo plane. And I was just a kid. I was, you know, 10, 11 years old. And I guess they lost one of the planes, and it was cocaine they were moving. And when we got up in the air, we'd fly over the state of Acre. And when we got into Colombia, he would. There, I had a handler, a guy that spoke English, and he would give me an in an IV drip. Put him. I was a psychic for them. Like I would, if there was something police or some bad weather, they used me to navigate. He said I. He said he talked to through me. I. There were times that I talked fluent Spanish that he talked to his dead grandmother and uh, just, I said all kinds of stuff. He, he, he would always have a list of questions from people from the village during those trips, but I remembered none of really none of it. Some of it I do, um, but they were putting me under and using me. That's how they're doing the drug war. That's how they're avoiding being caught. They have, they're using psychics. And you think this has got to be CIA tech. So that guy owned me privately and that was his little business running. And when I hit puberty, I lost that ability. And so I went back to Seattle and lived there. I was kind of like, um, in a, it was like an orphanage of other kids there. And we were being put through the pedal gate stuff. We were sex slaves. Uh, without going into too much detail, uh, I eventually washed out of that. They gave us medication every day and they changed it one day and I became, I was allergic to it. They said, if you either eat this or you're going to the military. And after three or four days, I would take that medicine and just vomit. I was just, I couldn't do it. And so they did. She took me and drove me up the road to the back of a parking lot behind a store. And two guys got me in a van, gave me an injection, and I was off world. I woke up on the moon again. And I was trained for suicide missions as a support soldier for Mars. And I was shipped to Mars. That, that was the next step. I mean, I'm skipping through this without a lot of details just to get to it back to where you cover our question. I went to Mars and I was a support soldier. And there was a, probably a dozen of us then. And uh, we did three combat missions with existing U.S. Uh, Marine soldiers on Mars. And we engaged. There are giant bugs that live on Mars. There are giant insects that live that are indigenous there. And we engaged them and had fatalities. And as a result, the, I guess the bugs adapted quicker than they thought. And so they canceled the program. I was flown to a bigger city on Mars and uh, put through uh, aptitude testing. And I tested for skilled labor. And so then I went into ship repair and they, they gave me classes, which was more like the MK Ultra stuff, movies and drugs. And then after that, then I was shipped to series. So I think they were taking personnel or slave personnel and either trading them or selling them according to your aptitude. So if I would have been smarter, I could have been a, into communications or whatever. But I'd already been through, at that point in the 20 and back, I'd already been through enough um, mental abuse to where I wasn't exactly, uh, I didn't exactly have a great aptitude. Interesting. Have you ever considered that you might have actually done two 20 and backs? Did you ever wonder if you maybe did a 40 or a 60 and back? Well, no, I, I think that at, during one time that they sold us off to a race that had a different 20 and back technology. And what happened was they took all the slate, the German, the, the series colony Germans, in trading with another race of uh, ETs, traded people to go on like short, like 10 and backs, which we weren't supposed to. But they, I guess they had a separate technology that was not a danger. Um, in other words, the 20 and back tech that we were using, they said that you know if you went through more than that or more than 20 years, you could be harmed. And I think that we went through that program and what happened was everybody committed suicide. So the deal didn't go through. They said that they got the first they were trading technology for people, for manpower, and I guess that everybody committed suicide once they got on the other end of a shorter 20 back inside of it. And I think I went through that, but I, um, I just don't have enough to really talk about it soundly. You know, it's vague, so I don't really talk about it a lot, but I think that happened. Wow. Okay. Another exciting episode behind us as always it seems like we just run out of time just when it's starting to get really juicy um, you'll have to tune in next week for more details uh, we're gonna dissect more of Tony's fascinating story if you want to support this most essential work you can head over to dauntlessdialogue.com you can purchase some of our 
merchandise. We have uh, shirts and hoodies available and all. Hello and welcome back to another exciting episode of Breakaway here on Dauntless Dialogue. I'm your host Adam Riva and with me today is Tony Rodriguez who claims to be a whistleblower who has endured the 20 and back which is a program inside the secret space program where you are age regressed after serving a certain amount of time, uh, in his case just shy of 20 years, where they put you back into your normal life and here we are today where Tony is starting to recall some of his memories from that experience and he's sharing them with us and he's sharing what he thinks is relevant. Now today's topic is a little bit darker than any of the other ones we've done. We're going to be talking about some of the MK Ultra uh, child trafficking material uh, that Tony has to share with us. So Tony, welcome back to the show. Hello. Hello everybody. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. So why don't you start us off um, right after Peru before you had actually left for Mars? Um, <clears throat> well, the time in Peru was a kind of a limbo for what I was used for. Um, I mean, the time in between. Uh, in Peru, what I was doing, I was they were using some drug, some tech, and using me for um, intuitive work on shipments of drugs. So I assume that was a CIA thing. Uh, obviously, somebody connected with, there's an underground and they're all connected to each other. Um, but I got sick at the end of it. So uh, right around puberty, I lost the ability to do whatever it was that I was doing. And I went back to, I think, the guy that owned me, to my owners. And it was, he had a house and, um, on one of the islands around Seattle, in the Seattle area. And when I got there, they flew me back. They, I ended up on a, like a cargo plane and went to California. And then his wife picked me up and took me um, back to the home, which had been remodeled and had other boys living there now. Uh, you know, it's the same house that I'd been to a few years earlier, but it had changed. The downstairs had been remodeled and there were other boys living there, like, kind of like an orphanage. And you said in the last episode, you told us about the person's house whom you were staying with. And that he was, you know, a higher up in the Illuminati or in the deep state. Now, did you get to spend time with, were there other children there or was, was it just you by yourself? There were six or seven boys usually. Sometimes there were more. Uh, they came and went. Um, I was like already old, I guess, for something that, you know, for to, to be in, in trafficked. And um, I was think I was running and coming up on 13 years old when I was there. And there were a couple older boys than me, and mostly they were younger. Uh, and um, we, uh, we had the downstairs. Like I said, it had been remodeled. There were, geez, I want to say six rooms down there, bedrooms. They turned his big den that he did the sacrifice, you know, that had been turned into bedrooms. And then they had a few more bedrooms installed. Um, it's hard to talk about from with from scratch, but when I got there, they were there, and I didn't know what I was in for or what the deal was. Um, when I walked in, they had a they had a room set up to the side with a reel to reel movie camera, and a little like a couch and like a little living room set up. But it was a it was an old style reel to reel camera, and uh, I was excited. I thought I was going moving up in the world, and uh, I didn't think anything bad was going to happen to me at first, and. Um, which nothing did for the first few months, really. Um, it wasn't, um, it wasn't high speed 
uh, of the abuse of what what they were into. They didn't. It wasn't something that took place every day. They had a schedule, a calendar of events that they had that they uh, used us for. And you said the word sacrifice. Can you explain a little bit more about that? The very first time I had been there, right after the, I mean, I think I said this in the other episode, but the very first time I had been there, right after the MK, right after the abduction, I went through an MK Ultra uh, style class or mind programming, trauma based mind control. From there, I went to that house, and during that time, there I witnessed a a, a human sacrifice, I uh, ritual, a satanic ritual. He was a practicing Satanist, so. I, I found his identity. I found the house. I went back there. It's exactly like I remembered it. And um, but I don't tell people who it was, or because there are still people alive that could be dealt with it. I don't want to poke a hornet's nest, so I don't speak of the names. But they were real people, and I found them uh, and shared it with researchers. How old was the person who was sacrificed, and, and was it male or female? It was a boy. He was much younger at the time. I would have been nine and he was much younger than me. So he was five or six maybe. Um, and I didn't witness the actual death of him. He was already dead when I came in the room and he had been opened up and he kept all his, kept all his blood in buckets, uh, that he was draining it and saving it for. And, uh, he made us, uh, made up, it was myself and two other kids like me and then two women and him, and they had masks on. They had the, and uh, they were naked, and uh, they made us eat some of the kid. That was part of the ritual. And then he did some. He had a he, he had a full setup there. And uh, then they drugged us, and that was the exact same thing like they did for the shipments in uh, Peru. They take all they put all the kids up on tables and put an IV in our arm and put us under. He was doing that for business advice, like you know, uh, channeling, trying to find info from the future or from the past. They were using. That's the kind of tech they're using, like ESP tech. What, can you go into that a little bit more? So, so he has you unconscious, and he has you hooked up to IVs, and how is that all supposed to work? Towards the end of the MK Ultra, they put us in an oxygen tent, and um, they would lower the oxygen until you were about to lose consciousness. And then uh, they had a, they had it rigged up. They had. Um, you know, like EEG stuff stuck to you. They had instruments um, that would monitor that when you're close to death and then oxygen would come back on um, and you'd wake up. And that went on for hours. It went on over all night long like that. And there was a bell that would ding. I, there were a dozen kids in the room that they were all doing the same thing to. And uh, after a while, I remember speaking like an adult and it was me. It was like my higher self had been like aroused and uh, you know, I was getting close to death and I felt like I was leaving my body. Like it was the close to death feeling. And then boom, the bell would ring and oxygen, you go back. And then a half hour later, however long it was, you got close to death again. And then the bell would ring, oxygen come on, you go back. And it was like each time I got closer to my self, like I, I got closer to a state of mind that was not a kid. It was not a child. It was some, it was myself. It was my higher self. And I remember that I finally got the, the part I remember of it is that I finally got angry. And I said something like, Hey, you need to let this kid die, make up your mind. And then the lights flickered around it, you know, like I was angry. And then they all came up. Hey, we got one. We got one. And that was the pat. That was a, whatever it was. It made me pass that. Um, and so what they were doing was, I, uh, I can only imagine that they're putting you close to death and that they can access at that point, um, other, other entity, other dead people. You know, how many times you have, you had heard of somebody that was, uh, dying and then they see their relatives in the room and they can talk to them. It's kind of like, I think it's, there, there's a, this is a science. This is a science. I'm not trying to be religious here. This is a science behind it. And they had it down to a science. So you got to think. Uh, on a military level of this kind of technology, if they can, if they can create their own psychics that are accurate, that can communicate with some other dimension, wherever people, where everybody goes, that uh, that's a very huge. And you got to think you could, if you had that, if you could accurately do that and you had three of these kids to yourself, 
you could be a billionaire pretty quick. And so that's kind of what happened. Um, okay. And so I remember when you and I were speaking off air, um, you had said that you had believed this was an ancient, let's call it a technology, an ancient technique. Um, what led you to believe that? And can you go into that in a little bit more detail? Well, you look back in history, um, they did that religion, the, the actual sacrificing of people has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And at one time, <clears throat> most of the cultures of the ancient world did practice ritual human sacrifice. There's that. And then the other thing is um, like the old oracles, like in Greece, they had the oracle. It's the same tech. It's the same thing. They always had young women that they would put where there was a gas. Where was that at? The oracle. And she, there was a temple at Delphi. And they put the world, woman in where there was less oxygen. They proved that, that that temple, there was a gas coming out. So she couldn't breathe very good. They put a girl in there and it was the same thing. It's the same thing. So they just, this is just another science of it. You know, I would hate to speak of this and some dummy to go try it, but uh, this has been, this is something that I experienced during a 20 and back, you know, I did, they took me on a 20 and back as a punishment. And this is what they used me for in the beginning. When I hit puberty, I lost the ability and they could, they could drug me and nothing happened. It was gibberish. So I was done with that. And I mean, they, they sold me, they used me for something else they could use into a different program, which was his private st stash of kids to be pedophiled for parties for the for the elites and there were big parties and they would dress us up and we were we were raped i know this is extremely hard to talk about and you've said that there's a lot of information that you haven't shared in other interviews there's a lot that you've held back intentionally and i know that this is an ongoing process for you healing from this kind of trauma and and getting past it you know and understanding really what it is that you went through, what happened to you. So where do you stand now in that healing process? And, and are, you, are you able to talk about these things a little bit easier or is it, is it still just as hard? It's a lot easier. In the beginning, I could barely talk about it to anybody. I could, it was hard to even think about any of this when I first got the original, the memories. Um, there's a lot of things I haven't covered because to, in, to, my, to myself, I remember things that didn't, haven't made sense to me. So I, it's hard to speak of them in an interview when the average viewer, half of what I'm saying is, is, is pretty out there. You know, it's pretty shocking for people. A lot of people that haven't heard, haven't studied others that have come forward with 20 and back, speaking about tw the 20 and back technology. So I'm, I'm not great to hear it for the first time because mine was kind of, not the uh, not the norm. I didn't go through the official twenty and back crowd. You know, I was they shuffled me through the side door and I bounced around. So my experience was much different than the typical person that they use for these programs. Um, and, and did you quickly? You said you wanted to quickly just address some of the criticisms that you know you've received recently. Sure. You know what? You've got a great crowd. What I've realized, I've read the comments on, you know, on your, on Dauntless and you've got a great group of people that are watching this. A lot of people were skeptical. I got a lot of skeptics and people gave me, um, so the eyes, he's lying because of his eyes. It's hard to talk to a computer for one thing. And last time when I, when I, um, I was in between two jobs that day, I just squeezed you in. I was so busy a few weeks ago. When we did that interview, I was bouncing off the wall. So I apologize for that stuff. But, you know, I'm not trying to mislead anybody here. There's, there's nothing for sale. And I'm just trying, people have asked me to tell my story. So I've told it. But in the very beginning, I just wanted therapy. And I got talked into doing a, an interview. And then one has led to another. And it's important. People should know. People should know that this stuff goes on. This is, this is a huge part of, you know, they have the UFO phenomena. Some people uh, think that it's one thing, it's many things going on, but people need to know that this is real, that this is, um, the 20 and back stuff is real and it's been abused. People that have had access and owned these programs have abused their power and uh, people like me exist. I mean, I'm not the only one. Like I said, there were 12 kids in that class that went through the, they were all in the same predicament, I assume. So people need to know this stuff, whether you believe it or not, you know, it'll come out later. It's all going to come out eventually. 
and you know, people can come back and look at what I'm saying later, I guess, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to sell you something and I'm not trying to draw, drum up a boogeyman here. Hmm. Well, while we're on the subject, can you quickly speak about some of the other people in the field who have, you know, kind of corroborated you or, or some of the people who've vetted you and, and found what you've said lined up with other accounts? Well, it was really hard in the beginning. I don't want to name names, but there's the big one that came out. And uh, every time, every week, I remembered something that could have proven me. He would say it in a show. <laughs> so um, all my evidence was hard to do. And when you, uh, there, were, there were a few things that I did with a researcher that, uh, with a few researchers that I said that uh, were, was first at. And, you know, the other thing is, in the 20 and back community, people that did that, I, as far as I know, I'm the first one that has spoken of the satanic connection to the people that are running it, the, the, the actual uh, Satanism involved. I, I did, I, that was one of the uh, key parts of my testimony in the beginning to researchers that gave credence to my testimony was that I, I, I um, accurately we, we had a Satanist, uh, somebody that was a practicing Satanist, well, had, had practiced Satanism in the past. And I told him what I went through and said, yeah, that's pretty, pretty much how it is. And, um, you know, I've, I've never had any contact in my real life with any of that. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty normal person. I've never met anybody that really did Satanism in my normal life. So I, did, I don't have any kind of uh, background with it. So I wouldn't have known. There are other things, uh, the other des ship designs and ship things that I said that were corroborated and that I was the first to say. So there are some articles about me and things I've said that uh, substantiate, but to me, I didn't further, I didn't believe it myself. I didn't believe me myself until I went there. The places that I, I lived on earth for six years in a 20 and back. And uh, I didn't believe it, um, but I remembered the places. And then I turned around and found them on the map. I went on Google earth and I found the house. I went there that following year and I flew to Seattle and I drove to the house and I knew the roads. I knew the stores, I knew the gas stations nearby, I knew where to, what the food was like, because I'd lived there for two and a half years, back in the 80s, in a 20 and back. Do you understand? It was mind blowing for that, for me to have that experience, because in my real life, that's provable, I had never been to Seattle, I'd never been there. Tony from Michigan, I grew up, I went to Hawaii a couple times, and, you know, I have family there, and then we did our typical vacation, I've been in Florida and the East Coast, I'd never been to Seattle. So how did I know my way around this island? I knew the beach. When I got to the beach, I knew that there were rocks. We used to go there. We, she took us there once, and we were throwing rocks at each other. And I knew there were bigger rocks down at the end of the beach. The biggest problem is I didn't take somebody and videotape it with me. But that was real. It happened. I, you know, I still know my way around there. I, I drove up to the house. I took a better route than the Google map gave me because I, out of memory. And I knew it before I got, oh, we're almost there. I'm almost there. And then 200 yards later, I was at the house. So I proved it to myself, which was, you know, you talk about healing. That's the biggest thing. You have to accept it yourself. And, you know, accepting being in space when it's not supposed to happen and being around ETs is some very, very hard to accept. So my memories of the 20 and back of, of Seattle are freakishly accurate. If they're accurate, then I have to trust the other memories too. Tony, I think part of the reason why there's a lot of either confusion or skepticism around your story is because your your version of the 20 and back is extraordinarily unique. Now, not only does it have the Satanism aspect like you mentioned, but it's also not a structured 20 away and then brought back. Uh, I think there's different types of technologies based on the extraterrestrial races that are doing the age regression, like you said. So some of them are only capable of doing 10 and back. Uh, whereas if you go beyond the 10 years, you would actually potentially face some, uh, something devastating to your health, uh, let's say. Um, there are people that are claiming to do 50 and backs and 60, 60 and backs. And honestly, I don't know enough about it to confirm or deny any of that. Um, my case my genetics or whatever, I was told that they were all 20 and backs, but I was lied to quite a bit then. In my case, it was 20 years. And most of the other people that I knew up there were on a 20 year schedule. There were people that, there were people that did a 20 and then went back and then they had to age in their real life and then they did another 20 back. 
that, that was, I was aware that that was one structure of, of the technology, but there are many different ways for them to achieve the same tech to do the, the same thing. So there's more than one way to, for them to skin that cat. And so I don't, I can't really say anybody's, you know, lying or truthful about it. I don't, I just don't know enough about it. I know that I went through it for, for 20. I did about six years on earth and then was moved in, moved into the space program, sold off to the military in, in her words and moved into the space program and ended up on series, series colony. And can you tell our listeners what was the nature of the technology that was used on you to age regress you? Oh, um, I mean, during the experience that, you know, it's funny because it took a long time. The, the return when I, when I left, yeah, now we're skipping away from Seattle, but when I, when I left, the, they came and got me and uh, walked me and I flew on a craft back to the moon, to the lunar base. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. I lost you on there. Uh, I flew back to the trapezoid base and, uh, went through another round of uh, the trauma-based mind control, uh, like a deprogramming. Like they, they put you in different stations. They had, it, it was very industrialized and you went into, it was like, like a, like a high speed hospital, you know, that you could go through quickly, but they were, they were, there were hypnosis. It was programming about it. They did the, the ship, the pirate ship thing. And then they did the other thing, the blurry face to make, you know, I still, everybody that I remember, from back then is uh, sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Keep going. The um, they put you through first. It was like the ship thing, and I thought that was ridiculous, and I laughed about it. And I was combative. To, you know, the, it's a long story, but I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to forget. I wanted to remember. And a lot of people that come back don't want to remember. A lot of people are, they don't want to remember the 20 years because it was terrible. I, for whatever reason, for a few reasons, wanted to remember, and I didn't want to forget the people I knew there. And so I was combative. And somebody on the ship told me, he said, it's the law. They can't. What are they going to do? If you are combative right now, they can't punish you. They have to get you back. They've only got so much time. And so you can uh, tell them no. They're not, and we were always so... Um, conditioned to get punished if we did disobeyed that that little window of a few days I was very combative I was very uncooperative with them and uh at least as much as I I mean at least for me I mean on my in my mind but um it was a long process that you went through the hypnosis and then through another it was another tech man and, and what what it did was it made everybody that you remember you there, you can I can remember their bodies but I can't their faces blurry you faith, you know, it's like uh, it was a local thing. They had, they had some kind of tech in the spot, and then there was another during that process. There was like a chair you sat in with a machine, and it completed the tech, completed the 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 effect, the programming of it. So people, most people that I think about, their face are blurry in that, and uh, it's common with other people that I've spoke to. I mean, I went from there, and then. Um, into a medical thing. And then they finally put, and I ended up getting injections every day, a couple times a day, like all through, that's why I'm so deathly scared of needles. They put injections you had to stay still. And I was like, no, what if I want to roll over? You know, I was still being combative. And it was a tall white gray that was the doctor. And he said, look, if you, they didn't know how to act. They didn't know how to deal with somebody that was not, I said, no, he said, sit on the table. I said, no, he did, totally didn't know what to do. And he said, well, if you don't sit on the table, uh, I'm going to have to call somebody and you're going to end up getting hurt. You know, somebody came and told him, you know, the, the reason with me like that. But then they said, sit still. And they put the, they put like a black uh, frame around me to keep me from moving. You had to stay perfectly still during this, these injections to immobilize you. And it was, it felt like weeks of time that that, that I had to stay there immobilized with a tube feeding me. Um, but he said, if you move, he's like, you can move if you want, but you're going to get badly injured. You're going to go back to your normal life and have back problems. You could have uh, your spinal cord. It has to be perfectly straight. He's some, it was something like that. Your spinal cord can't move or you'll have horrible back problems. And so I did. I, you know, I didn't move as best I could. And it was torture. That was a, that was a very uncomfortable thing. Um, 
Then one day uh, the injection stopped and they came and wrote, you're on a table, like a stretcher. And they rolled me into another room and put a, you go into a machine and it was like, I got incinerated. That was the, that, it, there were effort, there were golf sized, golf ball sized pockets of me that were in pain that start first. It was one or two. And it was like, you know, like a golf ball sized pain in my legs and everything. And then more came and then finally it felt like I got incinerated. And from that, I woke up and was back to my nine-year-old body. When the, I lost consciousness from there. And when I woke up again, I was nine years old. I was back to being a nine-year-old kid. Did you have any lasting negative effects when you were back in your nine-year-old body, like, like he had warned you about? No. No, I'm pretty healthy. Um, I, a lot of, they say a lot of people that go through the 20 and back have severe health problems. I'm 46 right now. I'm still in very good health. No. Um, besides your typical falling apart kind of stuff. But uh, I, I don't have any kind of uh, health issues right now. So I don't think so. Um, but I woke up as a kid then. And then the interesting part about that was that I didn't remember the 20 years. When I woke up back of that kid, I could remember my mom and dad. Now I could remember my sister and my home and I was back to myself, but I didn't remember the 20 years. I didn't remember where I just was or series colony or any of that when I, when I, so, 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 so I was taken and had memory of mom and dad and then they did a process and I had no memories. Then I lived 20 years and they did a process and I went back to that kid that had memories of mom and dad. So how they did that, I don't know. I don't know if they cloned a body and moved me from my consciousness of body. I don't know if they do if it's a mental thing. I don't, I honestly, I don't know. I don't know. But that's what happened. That's what the experience was like for me. After it was all happened and uh, back in May of 15, I started getting the memories back. And now I remember both. I remember the 20 years. It kind of reminds me of the um, Neuralizer in uh, Men in Black, right? Where you, it's like they hold the light up to your eye and flash it and then you've got the temporary amnesia or something like that. Um, so, so I want to just... I want to just circle back because we, we got away from the uh, the Seattle story with uh, the the Satanists that you were staying with. Um, I'm sure that there's there's more there. Did you want to cover anything else um, at the time spent in in his house or in his care? Well, that was there was a lot that happened. There were you know, I mean, how graphic do you want to get? Yeah, um, I mean, whatever you're comfortable sharing. Ultimately, what happened, I'll try to just sum it up. Um, they were having parties, and for the most part, they have, a, they have a calendar that's not like ours. There's no Christmas and Easter on their calendar. They have a calendar of their own set of holidays, and some of them were uh, sex parties, sexual. And some of them had boys, and some of them had girls, and some had both. And so they, they, somebody would come, they, we had, we, we, it was like living in an orphanage. The typical day we woke up, we did put, we did a calisthenic routine. We didn't eat much food. They had us on a, on a strict diet. So we were skinny. It was the skinniest I've ever been. And then we had the rest of the day, we had little board games. We had a VHS player with a couple movies and with gay porn. And we had uh, a swimming pool, you know, you know, and in the summer we could play in this pool and it was a bunch of kids living like a, that was our typical day. Um, once or twice a month during the summer, only in the summer months was when they would throw a party and be in midnight and they'd dress us up and they'd drug us and they would choose. They would line us up, you know, so they'd line up and all the kids had to line up and they would pick us. So I, you didn't get picked for every party and they would chain us together and take us out. And they had like a carpet on the, on the grass with pillows and there was security guys, security. Like if we tried to get away, we'd get beat up and then far away, there'd be girls on the other side. And so that's, you had to work those parties. And it was um, like, uh, like you see, like some, uh, you know, like the eyes wide shut stuff. Um, but you were basically a, we were basically a booth at a party, uh, the boys. And that's what they kept us for. That was, and they said it was a cushy job. The threat there was always that, um, you know, if you don't behave, you're going to be sold to the military and you'll probably be killed you'll probably be in combat or something. You'll be sold off. So if you don't behave here and don't want to stay here, you're going to sell We're going to sell you to the military. 
And that was the threat there. So we kind of we kind of felt like we had it better than that. Because because like I said, ninety nine percent of the time we were just kids around the pool. Uh, you know, it was like an orphanage though. We all kind of didn't get along very well. And uh, it was a very, very cold, very emotionless, loveless existence. It was a very lonely time for me. I'm sure that during your time spent there, you saw the faces of, of politicians or people who, you know, wealthy establishment types. Um, you, don't, you don't have to name names because I'm, I'm sure that wouldn't be a good idea, but you can just confirm that or deny that. Yeah, there were politicians there, yep. and sometimes there were guys from the military that picked us. They would come and pick kids to take to parties, to leave the, leave the property and go. And some kids were bought and sold, I guess. They would come and go. But yes, there were, there were, it was, there were political fundraisers, and I found plenty of newspaper. I found pictures of the party that I was at, which was also freaky. But um, I don't really want to get into it. Like I said, I don't want to stir up the hornet's mm -hmm. nest. Yeah. Now, now, what was this? What was surrounding the house? Was it in the middle of the woods? Was it gated? Was it in a community? It was gated. He had six or seven houses on five hundred acres, with a wall around it. It's gated. He had his own gate, his own private. He had a. There was a guy that I swear to God wasn't a human at all. The 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 land keep the landscaper the the taker guy was. The, most evil person you ever, he, he, I swear he wasn't a human. He behaved very, very strangely. And he was their security and he did everything. He kept us in line. There were at times kids tried to escape and they, he found them the next day. And they were, they, um, you know, of course it's an Island with freezing water around. They were going nowhere, but they tried to escape and uh, they were caught and then they were gone. They got sold off again, like probably to the military, some other stop. But, um, it was pretty private and uh, he had his own, uh, you know, for it also he had his own butcher uh, shop, a butcher set up there for somebody that sacrifices people. He had his own way to dispose of bodies. You know, it was a farm. And were you ever taken off the property kind of, were you taken into town? Were you taken shopping? Were you allowed to leave at yeah, times? Yeah. She never went alone. Uh, so he was never there. And the whole time I lived there, they, they were, you know, I was aware that they were doing the rituals, but it was elsewhere in the home. I never witnessed it again, you know, you know, so it was, it was always really sad. It always like was heartbreaking when I knew that they were doing a ritual because I, I thought that somebody might be dying, yeah. but uh, he was never there. He was hardly ever there once a month, once every couple months he'd pop in. She was there all the time and she was not happy with her lot. And she did not live like a billionaire. Every time she went somewhere shopping or something, she took one of us, one or two of us with her. So we got to go, you know, drive. She took turns and took us with her. So we did take the ferry and then go to places. And then she was getting um, drugs for us that they would, for the parties, they drug it. They gave us an injection and it was like, you couldn't feel a thing. You know, it was like mean kind of drugs. But she was getting them and they were the kind of drugs that you had to keep cold. And um, so she was meeting somebody for that. I remember all the time we'd go places and meet a guy and she'd pick up whatever. And they were like intravenous kind of drugs that she would get and other stuff. But, uh, and then the store, there was a store up the street. She never went anywhere alone. She always took one of us. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I mean, this is, this is horrible stuff. Um, this isn't fun to talk about. It's not fun to um, shine a light on this kind of evil but I think it's necessary and I think your story is going to be increasingly vindicated as time goes on and as more of the Pizzagate narrative and the Pedogate narrative unfolds before our very eyes, uh, we're going to start to see these people fall. And I've certainly done my fair share of research and, and presentation on this material on this channel. So for anyone who's new to this and this is, you know, um, just your, your first initiation into it, uh, I encourage you to go check out some of the other material that we've shared on the Pedogate material. Tony, I think that's all the time that we have for today. I want to thank you for coming on the show again. You'll have to you know tune in next time for uh, our next episode where we're going to talk to Tony about his time spent on Mars. I'm Adam Riva, and we'll see you in the